Hello, social media friends. I'm Viridiana Marquez with DRB Media Communications Digital News, and Danny Barrera has the story. The Odessa chapter of the League of United Latin American Citizens hosted a community discussion on domestic violence in the Odessa City Council Chambers at City Hall. The meeting was to be focused on the violent death of Heather Leanne Rodriguez by a former boyfriend and why the system of laws to protect domestic violence victims failed Heather Rodriguez. Well, speaking from my personal, the, um, on my cousin's situation, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit disappointing because it's almost like take it off our hands, it's their problem now. And I feel like it's more of a partnership. It should be um, kind of like a liaison, you know? All of us work together from the police and make sure to have a follow-up on it. I wish Heather would have had that. I wish somebody would have taken her name, name and number down and said, I'll have a case manager call you from the crisis hotline. I'll have somebody call you from the Texas Council on Family. But nobody did. And. It's disappointing and it's sad and it's unfortunate because I feel that the resources they say are there for us or for the people, but how do they get the resources in their hands and use them appropriately? State Representative Brooks Landgraf, who authored Monica's Law, explained what the law provides to victims of domestic violence. Uh, what we refer to uh, as Monica's Law, which is really a law that established uh, the Texas Protective Order Registry that went online, went live about a year ago uh, in September of, uh, of 2020 uh, as a result of legislation that we passed in, in the 2019 uh, legislative session. And very briefly, what the Protective Order Registry is, is it's a resource uh, for the public and also for law enforcement uh, that relates to protective orders that have been issued by a court after a due process hearing uh, that relates to domestic violence. Um, sadly, Monica's law came from, uh, was, was inspired by a, uh, a victim of deadly domestic violence right here in Odessa in 2015. And uh, as is far too often the case, the abuser, the perpetrator, uh, had a long history of this type of violence, but uh, through cunning uh, was able to keep that past <laughs> hidden from women that he uh, uh, sought to have relationships with. Uh, and, and one reason why he was able to conceal his past uh, so well, and, and we're using hidden as an example, but sadly uh, this happens far too often, uh, is that different jurisdictions would issue a protective order and unless you live in that jurisdiction, you really don't have access to that information. And so what we wanted to do is take this public information and put it all in the same place online uh, so that people, the public, can search uh, to see if someone that they may be interested in having a relationship with or, or for whatever reason, uh, can see if there is a pending protective order uh, against that person that's been issued uh, by a magistrate anywhere in the state of Texas. Uh, and so we really broke down those jurisdictional boundaries that have been in place uh, really forever. Uh, and, but we wanted to make sure that that was, that the public has access to that information because that information can be very powerful and empowering and allow people to make decisions that are best for, for themselves and their families. It was revealed that Heather's former boyfriend was harassing her at her job. Monica Franco said that Heather was told by Heather's employer, a business located in Midland, that she needed to file a protective order before she could return to work. If Heather would have known that the incident from her employer was part of that information and she could add it in there, why didn't anybody tell her that? Hey, that's part of your protective order. She was not allowed to go back to work because he was harassing her. Why couldn't somebody know that information? Why aren't employers on top of this? HR, people talking about, hey, I had the situation, this is what you do. If the offense is occurring in, in, in Odessa or Hector County and she's working in Bidlin, by all means her employer has every right to be uh, concerned about the violence going on but they cannot file that form of protective order through Midland County, it has to be done through Hector County because the offense occurred here. And all it would take from there is for the victim to take proof that the uh, assaults have taken by 
reported it to police and presented it to the court is where they will then issue a protective order for her. Deputy Chief Robert DePorto said that after information is gathered during a domestic or family violence case, it is presented to the district attorney or county attorney. Yes, once we gather all the information in regards to a certain case, we do present it to the district attorney or the county attorney. Now, when it makes it across over there, then it is up to them to decide whether that case will per, uh, whether will continue to pursue it or sometimes when it does get across the street, the victim fails to want to pursue it, so sometimes it's dropped. Jeanette Fierro, a domestic violence victim and survivor, tells her story of abuse by her partner and her journey of becoming financially independent and survival. Soon I was hiding the bruises on my arms from where he would grab me. Still, I stayed. Targeting my insecurities with his cruel remarks, punching walls and breaking doors in his fits of rage. He even took a box cutter to my mattress after accusing me of cheating, all while he was a cheater. Still, I stayed. During a vacation one time, he threatened to jump off a ninth floor balcony after I told him I wanted us to break up. He did that often. Threatened to kill himself if I left. Still, I stayed. He managed to isolate me from my friends and family. I don't know how many phones he broke. One night, I told him to leave my apartment. He spent the entire night sitting in his truck outside of my window to make sure I wouldn't leave. Still, I stayed. I left him and moved back home, here to Odessa. Five months later, he moved after me. Claims of finding God, extravagant romantic gestures, gifts, and flowers, claims that he was a changed man, convincing me that all we needed was couples counseling. I fell for it, and I took him back. During my honeymoon, he accused me of staring at a bartender and choked me in the room we had on the cruise ship. I still remember covering the bruises with makeup on my face because I was embarrassed for the other passengers to see me. Still, I stayed. My son was born. The cheating, manipulation, and abuse became worse. He punched a window above my head so hard that he broke his finger. He took all my jeans from the washer and ripped them so I wouldn't have any. There was that time he slammed my head so hard into a shower wall that it caused a crack on one of the tiles. I hated seeing that tile every time I showered. When my son was 10 months old, he held him with his right hand and hit me in the face with his left. I will never forget the look on my infant son's face. He immediately began to cry. He knew his mama had been hurt. Of course, the following day was a fake remorse, asking for forgiveness, forgiveness. And yet, I stayed. And in all this, not one time did I call the police. Then one night, I did. I had locked my son and myself in the bedroom and called for help. He fled before the police could arrive. I didn't file charges, but the simple phone call to the police was a massive step for me. I had had enough. I was not just living for me now, I was living for my son. So I decided I was not going to give my son this bullshit life. I began plotting my escape, pretending to be the same old forgiving wife, using his income to pay off debts and get myself set to leave him for good, to prepare myself. <coughs> Finally, in May of 2014, I asked him to leave. He thought it would be another brief separation. He thought wrong. 
In September of 2014, our divorce was final, but the fight was far from over. See, the most dangerous time with an abuser is when they realize they've lost control. He would show up at my house or my job unexpected. Then one night, November 2014, he showed up at my home, two in the morning, demanding that I let him in. He tried to kick my door in. I still remember the fear while calling the police, telling dispatch, please hurry. He always carried a 40 caliber pistol. I thought, no, I can't, I can't go like this. The door didn't break. To this day, I say God kept that door from breaking in. He heard me calling the police and left. I ran to the room where my son was sitting on my bed, petrified, with his arms in the air, crying out for his mom. Police arrived, took the report. He caused thousands of dollars of damage to my home and vehicle. The next day, I purchased a firearm. I took my concealed handgun course and carried my firearm everywhere. Never complacent, never at peace. It was mental torture. I feared for my life. At night, I would move my sofa to the front of my door so it would make it hard for him to bust through it. My dog slept in the hallway to alert me of any sound. I never slept. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I could feel someone staring at me in a window. One day, he showed up at my home again unexpectedly. The sound of his truck, I learned it real quick. I dialed 911. I went to the living room, living room where my son was watching TV. And I said to him, go to mama's room and close the door and don't come out. His response, Okay, mama. He runs, goes into my bedroom. I start, he started pounding the door and tried once again to kick it in. I remember like it was yesterday. Phone in one had pistol in the other, telling dispatch that if he breaks the door in, I was gonna shoot him. And the truth is, I wanted that fucking door to break. I wanted him to break through so I could kill him and this would be all over. God had other plans. The door didn't break. He left again before police arrived. Every single thing that would happen that year, I would call the police for everything. Even when he stole the rake from my driveway, every single thing I called, I called, I called. I saved all the harassing texts, gathering evidence, filing any charges I could against him, building a case. Finally, a warrant was issued. State felony charges on criminal mischief and a misdemeanor of harassment. They got him. He served three months in jail, and while there, he, he was served with a protective order. Two years, he never bothered me again. My point is, nothing happened in my situation until I took the steps until I made the moves. We are where we are in life because we choose to be. I decided to start calling for help. I decided to buy a firearm. I decided to get my concealed handgun license. I decided to plot and plan my escape because I'll be damned if I leave my son without a mother. Because that's what it takes. We can't blame others and expect them to help us when we don't even help ourselves. Police officers aren't superheroes. A piece of paper will not always deter someone from hurting you. Protect yourself, prepare yourself. Learn a skill that will make you financially free from these fucking abusers. Prepare yourself because if you don't, you're stuck. Teach your children that. Stop raising them in this shit. Stop using them as an excuse to stay. It is better to come from a broken home
than to grow in a broken home. It starts with you. Teach your children that. Teach them financial independence so that they never feel stuck. Teach them responsibility and action for yourself. Use the resources you have available to you. Seek help and don't stop until you find it. Thank you. If you or someone you know is fleeing domestic and sexual violence, contact the Crisis Center of West Texas at 1-866-627-4747. Now, having a partner, whether it's a husband or an ex-girlfriend or whoever it is, having them arrested. So we want to make sure that clients know they don't have to stay in the shelter to get counseling or case management. They don't have to be documented. They don't have to have citizenship status to get any services from us. They don't have to be from Texas. They don't have to be from Odessa. And that there's lots of paths to Crisis Center and the easiest way is through that hotline. And if you're never sure, you know, if you're making that first call and you're not confident you qualify, call anyway, because we can have that conversation. You'll have a trained staff member who can answer in English and in Spanish and almost all cases to make sure that if you're not ready, you get some questions answered. And maybe those questions getting answered is the step that you need to feel ready to leave that situation. For DRB Media Communications Digital News, Danny Barrera. Thank you for following us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also at DRB Media Communications Digital News TV. For DRB Media Communications Digital News, Viridiana Marquez.